In this unit, we are going to cover the direct object marker. So you may be wondering, what is a direct object marker? So the definite object marker, I think, is best explained by beginning in English. If we look at the following sentence, the king guarded the city. So our subject is the king, and our object is the city. In other words, the king is acting upon in some way, is doing something to the city. It's not that the city is guarding the king. Now, let's look at the same thing in Hebrew. So here we have a short sentence. Hamelech shamar et ha'ir. Now, in this case, Hamelech is our subject, and we know it's definite because of the he in front of Melech. Also, in this case, ear, the city, is the object. And how do we know this? We know this because of this marker, et. Et, kind of attached, doesn't have to be, but most of the time it is attached, and we'll talk about this in a moment. But when the et precedes the definite marker and a noun, it's telling us that the city is the object. Now, this means that there is more flexibility in word order. And so you can have a sentence that looks like this. Et ha'ir ha'melech shamar. In this case, et ha'ir, although it, it begins the sentence, is still the object because we have the et marker telling us it's the object. And ha'melech is still the subject. So although the word order has changed, the meaning is the same. It simply may be that by putting ha'ir at the beginning, the focus is on what the king is guarding. But we would still translate this as the king guarded the city. Now, the following two phrases here mean the exact same thing. And you can see we're talking really about variant spellings. So in most cases, you will see this first example where you have et with the segel and it's actually attached to the noun. So this dash or my cave is simply connecting the short object marker to the next word so that they're treated grammatically as one word. When these two words are attached, as I said, the vowel of the direct object marker reduces from the tsere. So the basic word, if it's standing all by itself, is eight with the tsere. But when we attach it to a noun, the stress is no longer on eight, and so the vowel reduces from the tsere to the segel. One way of thinking about this is, for example, when the words are connected with the dash or the makaif, it's as if they are one unit. So if you see trope mark or accent marks on this telling you how to chant, the first one you can see, et hanashim, would receive only one trope mark, et hanashim. While if you have et and hanashim, then each one gets its own musical marker. So again, the full formula is eight as its own word, preceding then the noun as a definite noun. And this tells us this is the object. So let's look at a few examples from the Bible. So you may recognize this first verse of the entire Bible. Breshit bara Elohim et hashamayim 
the et ha aretz. So note here that et ha shamayim and et ha aretz are both objects, and we know this because they are both preceded by eight. And in this case, the trope marks are hiding the tzede a little bit, but because they're not connected here, and it's kind of random when the Masoretes chose to connect and not to connect, then, um, but this marks the direct object. And Elohim is our subject. So if we take the first word in the beginning, then we move to our subject, Elohim, God, then bara, created, and then our objects, et hashamayim, the heavens, the et haaretz, and the earth. All right, another example. This is also from the first chapter of Genesis. Vayar Elohim et haor ki tov. So notice in this case, our object again is marked by the et preceding the definite noun. In this case, we have the makef, and so the et only has a sagol on it. God saw the light, that it was good. And now on to a mini review. <laughs> 